Unconsciously, Zuckerman was frightened of everything. Frightened of success and frightened of failure. Frightened of being known and frightened of being forgotten. Frightened of being bizarre and frightened of being ordinary. Frightened of being admired and frightened of being despised. Frightened of being alone and frightened of being among people. Frightened, after Karnofsky, of himself and his instincts, and frightened of being frightened. Unconsciously suppressing his talent for fear of what it might do next. Philip Roth became a household name in the late 1960s with his outrageous bestseller, Portnoy's Complaint. Since then, his chronicles and comedies of Jewish America have established him as one of the key writers of his generation. But success has come with its share of hostile criticism. Roth has been attacked for obscenity, accused of anti-Semitism, charged with plundering his own life and calling it fiction. Amid speculation about the links between his novels and the facts of his life, Roth has consistently declined every request for a television interview or profile. Now, to mark his 60th birthday, he has broken his long silence to set at least some of the records straight about his life, his books, and the links between the two. Note to the reader, this book is a work of fiction. The names, characters, places, and incidents either are products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events or locales of persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. This confession is false. Years ago, I had to give a lecture in Miami Beach with a large Jewish audience. And I was thunderstruck by the hostility to Roth. And one lady said, with really with crescendo mounting with every vocable, why does Philip Roth hate the Jews? And I said, no, madam, he does not hate the Jews. He merely writes about them. American Jews had shifted from uh, immigrant status to their fantastic post-war middle-class, bourgeois supremacy in many ways. Philip Roth caught perfectly some of the ludicrousness and the pathos of people who weren't quite used to their new prosperity and their new self-importance. Kalala, once more! More what? More chicken. Major Kalala. They'll have to roll you on the links. What are you talking about? Look at that. What's a couple of pounds? Uh, look at this. Ronald. Would you care to stand up and bear your middle? Oh, uh, no, thank you. Well, I'm glad that somebody is aware of how to behave at the table. Thank you. Chicken? Oh, no, thank you. Eat like a bird. Goodbye, Columbus was written when Roth was a young college instructor at Chicago University. It won him the National Book Award, but also marked the beginning of Roth's long battle with some of his Jewish readers, who saw it as a betrayal. There were some pretty nasty attacks. Uh, now, those who launched the nasty attacks would say these were pretty nasty stories. I don't agree. They were, they were not nasty stories. They were so mildly satiric, it seemed to me, that this was a gross overreaction. Um, but there it was. Um, a rather eminent rabbi, I mean, I, I didn't know he was an eminent rabbi, because I don't keep up with those things, but I was told he was an eminent rabbi, wrote a letter uh, to the B'nai B'rith at the Defamation League, which came into my hands, which concluded with this line, what is being done to silence this man? It's not your fault you don't know what Gentiles think when they read something like this. But I can tell you, they don't think about how it's a, a great work of art. People don't read art. They read about people. And how do you think they will judge the people in your story? Have you thought about that? Yes. And what have you concluded? I can't put it into a conclusion. I didn't write 15,000 words, so as now to put it all into a one-word conclusion. Well, I can. Your story, Nathan, as far as Gentiles are concerned, is about one thing and one thing only. It is about kikes. Kikes and their love of money. That is all our good Christian friends will see. I've watched you all your life. You, you are, you're a good, kind, and considerate young man. You aren't somebody who writes this kind of story and then pretends it's a truth. But I did write it. 
I am the kind of person who writes this kind of story. And then, um, in 69, I published Portnoy's Complaint. <clears throat> well, that certainly, uh, didn't help. People instantly took this book as, uh, as autobiography, and a shameful autobiography. And it was. I mean, nobody had written a book uh, in which the, the hero, and the re knowing that readers automatically will identify author with hero. So it's a bit disingenuous to, to say, as Philip sometimes did, that uh, how he couldn't imagine how, why could they mistake him for this guy? Uh, because he had the courage to, 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 to reveal certain things that everybody did. Uh, for example, masturbation, uh, which became almost a kind of uh, shorthand term for that book. The attitude behind it, as I read it, is, uh, you don't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, you know, um, in spite of all prohibitions, I'm irrepressible, and that's how it's going to be, and you're going to have to listen to me. I think he does have some of the air of a stand-up comic about him. I don't know whether it was written as a provocation. Um, it, you know, a book comes out of um, many, many things, and uh, rather far down on the list is, is the desire to provoke somebody. Uh, it's very hard to spend two years working at a book simply to provoke others. You'd have to be a, a more peculiar character than I am, I think, for that to be your primary motive, your sole motive, or even up there with the, with the high motives. But who knows, I have low motives too. Uh, at any rate, um, this was taken as a considerable provocation and uh, the reaction to it was much greater even than the reaction to Goodbye Columbus. This was not a youthful indiscretion, clearly. Um, and so the world of readers on this book divided very sharply between those who seemed to uh, uh, take it as, uh, as something uh, worthwhile, entertaining, alive, uh, new, novel, etc and those who saw it as a kind of anti-Semitic uh, tirade. This hero is not just some miserable wretch writhing in his lusts. He is the Jew avenging himself of his upbringing in a Jewish home, which has become detestable to him, by going out and laying shiksas, thereby freeing himself from the nightmare of Mama. This is the book for which all anti-Semites have been praying. I dare say that with the next turn of history, this book will make all of us defendants at court. We will pay the price, not the author who revels in obscenities. They were saying to me, your books will endanger others physically. That's a serious question. Uh, I always took it seriously. I always believed they were wrong. Uh, I think I've been proved right, by the way. Uh, I don't think that any book I've published, any word I've written, has endangered any Jew physically. Um, nor do I really believe that my books have been, as they said, fuel for the uh, fires of the anti-Semites. Um, so I believe that in that case they were wrong about the consequences and I was right about the consequences. Now, how, had I abided by the prohibitions they would have laid down, um, what, what would have been served? The consequences did not follow. Uh, I guessed. Um, sure, it's a hell of a gamble. You say, who are you to guess whether there will be uh, dangerous consequences uh, flowing out of your work? Well, there's a certain audacity in writing books. Uh, without the audacity, you can't write the books. And perhaps there's even a certain recklessness in writing books. Um, I think that the, the society I live in can live with my recklessness such as it is. Uh, I didn't write these books in uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, I didn't write these books in Nazi Germany. I wrote these books in uh, 20th century uh, America. And I was pretty sure that uh, uh, in this society, the consequences predicted would not occur. And I turned out I guessed correctly. Uh, lucky me, lucky them.
my parents became his protector. You know, he took a lot of gaff from the Jewish community. My father had to take some of the punishment. And then there was a lot of, are you this, are you, to them? Are you one of these characters? Is this your character? Is that your character? Well, the, the man writes beautifully. So no matter how much is, is uh, autobiographical, and, and it's not in that sense, it's fiction. She was so deeply embedded in my consciousness that for the first year of school, I seemed to believe that each of my teachers was my mother in disguise. As soon as the last bell had sounded, I would rush off for home, wondering as I ran if I could possibly make it to our apartment before she had succeeded in transforming herself. Invariably, she was already in the kitchen by the time I arrived and setting out my milk and cookies. When you came inside, dear, my heart grew light and this old world seemed new to me. You're really swell, I have to admit you deserve expressions that really fit you. And so I've racked my brain hoping to explain all the things that you do to me. For me, a bit's to shame. Please let me explain. By me, a bit's to shame means you're great. I knew that my father and sister were innocent of my mother's real nature, and the burden of betrayal that I imagined would fall to me if I ever came upon her unawares was more than I wanted to bear at the age of five. I think I even feared that I might have to be done away with were I to catch sight of her flying in from school through the bedroom window or making herself emerge limb by limb out of an invisible state and into her apron. Anyone who's read Roth knows that he's the most family-oriented writer imaginable, you know. He has done Newark stone by stone, brick by brick, aunt by aunt, uncle by uncle, synagogue by synagogue, gutter by gutter. I don't know anyone in the world who has done his old environment so thoroughly, so lovingly, so nostalgically, at the same time so unsparingly. In the 1930s and 40s, the Wequaic section of Newark was a peaceful, thriving, almost entirely Jewish suburb. Somebody, I say, somebody now. Yes, I know. Claghorn's the name, Senator Claghorn, I that know is. you're from the South. When I'm in New York, I'll never go to the Yankee Stadium. Now, wait. <laughs> I'll never go to the I had imbibed the mood and aura of family life in my neighborhood very strongly, I think. And I didn't just grow up in my house. And I think when you take a look at the street I grew up on, you see that there are some 40 or 50 houses on that street, maybe even more. Um, and in each house lived 10 or 12 people. So there we've got 500 people for a start, and that's only one street. You multiply that times the 10 streets adjacent to us, you have a huge population. And you're a school kid, you have kids in school, you make friends and so on. So you're in a lot of, ha you, have a, you have a great perch uh, as a child writer. Uh, you're in people's houses, you're in their kitchens, you're in their bedrooms, you're in their bathrooms, you sleep over, you hear everything. No one hide, dreams that you're gonna turn out to be this terrible little writer. And if you are um, an incipient writer, you tend to have a good memory you tend to be observant. You may even be a good mimic, so you, you, you hold the material that way. And all this stuff uh, was there to be tapped. Well, as a matter of fact, I've told him if he puts me in a book, I'll kill him. Because <laughs> he's tough. <laughs> he's also uh, my confidant. So <laughs> he's, he, he said, said to me, if you don't want it in a book, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're dead. I'll kill you. <laughs> How do the people close to you react to being written about, and did you think about that uh, while you were writing that mm. inhibit you in any way? The Polish Nobel Prize winner, Czesław Milos, as a poet, uh, said this, apropos your question. When a writer is born into a family, the family is finished. Thank <laughs> you.
I think that answers the question. <laughs> One of the first stories I ever wrote, which appeared in Goodbye Columbus, is a story about uh, an adulterous middle-aged man and uh, the affair he carries on with a woman across the street. And I suppose by now, I'm not, I won't be libelous if I say that in 1945, when I was 12 years old, a gentleman who lived in that house that I hope is off camera had an affair with a woman who lived in that house across the street. And uh, my father, uh, was called in to soothe everybody's temper and, and make peace between the families and between the respective spouses and so on. And he'd come home in the evening uh, after having um, been out on his peacemaking mission and tell us, my mother, my brother, and me, what had happened. And so uh, I was delighted by the story of adultery, not only on our street, but next door. For a kid in his uh, background to become uh, an author, uh, that formidable word, uh, requires an act of, of uh, self-anointment. <laughs> you, you're the only one with, you can, to pour the oil on you, you pour the oil on your own head. Um, you are not uh, licensed in any way. Uh, you haven't uh, gone through any um, school that turned you out as it would a dentist or a, a lawyer. So it all happens on your own authority. My goodness. Okay. I love it. Now, I never thought that would make its way into the oh, of course. stacks yeah. of, of uh, Weekway High School. Oh, Weekway. I think it even says Weekway High School in here. Graduate? You know? sure. Yeah, let's yeah. Let's see if anybody's ever read it though. Maybe Whoops. not that one. I have eight copies. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> I have eight copies. You have eight eight copies? Yeah. Well we can only buy four copies at a time. But that's an awful lot of copies yeah. to have. This is a little um cheer. I don't even remember, though, it appears in this book. I, I, Kai, I kiss, nobody likes us. We are the boys of the Quake High. I, I, Kai, Ochis, Kishmir and Tochis. We are the boys of the Quake High. Kishmir and Tochis is Yiddish, which I can't translate. <laughs> polite company. Polite, yes, in polite company. Well, you said we can talk about anything. I think Philip was the first one to be spectacularly sexually successful. <laughs> um, mm. He went, he found o older women <clears throat> pursuing him. What were older women? That's right. A year older, <laughs> eight months older. And Phil had a special quality. I, I think I would say when you mentioned uh, Stu, yeah. he sort of started to n know his path. He sort of had the courage, I think, to really branch out in a way. I mean, we, we all went into professions. Right. And that even though most of our uh, families or forebears had not been involved, we were, we were making strides in that direction, it was almost more acceptable. Philip was a kind of uh, iconoclast. He, he was, was a renegade. Like, and, yeah, right. uh, no question. And even though he did, finally, he did finally do what his father wanted him to do, but at, at the beginning, it was not that way. Um, and that's probably why. All right, he said. You be the biographer, and I'll be the friend. The biographer is still at the point, after having done a lot of research, where he's not even sure he wants to go through with it. Do I want to write this life? What's the real interest in this life? He doesn't just want to retell the story of Zuckerman's boring Newark. What interests him is the terrible ambiguity of the I. The way a writer makes a myth of himself, and particularly why. What started it? Where do they come from, all these improvisations on a self? I was born August the 26th, 1901, in the city of Newark, in the county of Essex. And what's today's date? Today's date is January the 7th, 1984. And you have how many sons? I have two sons. The first born is Sandy, who is now, was born on February the 26th. 56 years ago, and you'll have to figure it out for yourself. <laughs> and Philip, Philip was uh, born in 33, I believe. He went to a Chancellor Avenue School, graduated with Quick Quark High School, couldn't go to college, so he went one year to Rutgers University. And from, he was too young. So he had to wait. This, this is 
a confused description of my college career, but let it stand. So he, he went to uh, Rutgers University for a year. He then went to uh, Bucknell University. Why did he pick Bucknell? Personally, I don't know, but I think he, he said in one of his books that he wanted to, to go to a university, a Christian university, to find out how the other half of the world lived. And uh, did he find he, out? He found out. Well, he was a very strong-willed will, strong -willed man, and I was a strong-willed adolescent. And I think when I went off to college in my first year, we had a terrific row once when I came home. It was about corny enough stuff, about late hours or something. Uh, but I was accustomed to being on my own, and my father said, where were you? And I said, really, it's none of your business where I was. And we had a terrific knockdown, drag out uh, verbal fight. Everybody crying. Uh, it was the first real outburst of strong defiance, of saying, I am separate from you. I am independent from you. The person who should, of course, be standing right here to receive an award of honor from the New Jersey Historical Society is not the author of Patrimony, but the subject of Patrimony, my father, Herman Roth, whose tenure as a resident New Jerseyan didn't end like mine after less than two decades, but extended without interruption from his birth in Newark's Central Ward in 1901 to his death in an Elizabeth hospital 88 years later, and who for nearly half his long life sold life insurance here. Alas, it's the insurance man, and not the novelist, who came to know palpably the social history of Newark, New Jersey's largest and during the decades my father was employed there, its liveliest and most productive city. To know it not just neighborhood by neighborhood, not even just block by block and house by house and flat by flat, but hallway by hallway, stairwell by stairwell, furnace room by furnace room, and of course, kitchen by kitchen. His father, who you know is one of his great characters, and who appears over and over again as his favorite, um, uh, what shall I say, tyrant. The Yiddish word is nudge, you know, the one who's always probing. The father was really a shrew of uh, gigantic proportions, you know, but a loving shrew, like many shrews. And, uh, who never let the poor guy alone, to put it very simply. Two years ago, Roth published Patrimony, a non-fiction account of his father's old age and eventual death from a brain tumor. Patrimony uh, began as just some notes I was making to myself at the end of each day. It's in my nature as a writer, as a person, to record things when the going gets rough. Um, I've always done it, and I did it, of course, then. Um, I didn't know what these notes would come to. Uh, I imagine that perhaps somewhere down the line, it would be useful to know what it was actually like to watch somebody you loved um, die. Uh, it would be useful to me as a writer to authenticate what I wrote. Um, after three or four months, my father's situation more or less became resolved. That is to say, we knew that we were not going to have an operation. He decided against it. We all decided against it. And we were going to wait for the tumor to kill him. In other words, we were going to let him live with this tumor. And he would live out his life with this tumor. And then his end would come. So after the first three or four months, all of us having reached this decision, um, life returned to normal more or less. Your grandmother right. was Fanny Roth, sure, right. and originally, and then she married, married uh, Nathan Cohn. On she and on, to remembering the illnesses, the operations, the fevers, the transfusions, the recoveries, the comas, the vigils, the deaths, the burials. His mind, in its habitual way, working to detach him from the agonizing isolation of a man at the edge of oblivion and to connect his brain tumor to a larger history, to place his suffering in a context where he was no longer someone alone with an affliction peculiarly and horribly his own, but a member of a clan whose trials he knew and accepted and had no choice but to share. 
I don't think it was pain. It was that he was slowly losing vital functions. The, the one to go, the one that killed him, was his he couldn't swallow. And very shortly, he would have had to have a, a, some surgery so that he could be fed other than through his mouth. <sighs> this is a guy who was a tiger, was being diminished by inches. And uh, we, to say that one is, is glad that his father was out of that and prevented from what would have come next and next is so, somewhat inaccurate. I mean, losing him, uh, just as losing her mother was terrible. Anybody who's lost a parent that they love knows that. However, she was what, 87. He had a good run. To be sure, I knew what the ending had to be, but I didn't know what the circumstances of the ending would be, what the particulars would be, or what the ugly particulars would be. Uh, and in time, I found out, because in time, um, he became uh, terribly ill from this thing. It happened very quickly, and then he died. And then uh, after the funeral and after um, several days, I sat down. I, I didn't waste very much time. And I wrote the last chapter of the book. Um, and that was that. Now, did I ever tell my father that I was working on this book? The answer is no. Uh, would I have published this book had he continued living? The answer is no. Uh, I felt a certain freedom in writing it, knowing that it would not be published while he was alive. Um, and that's the story of the writing of that book. And at the ex next corner, there was another drugstore. You must not forget anything. But, uh... That's the inscription on my father's coat of arms. To be alive to him is to be made of memory. To him, if a man's not made of memory, he's made of nothing. And then I had a friend of mine lived in that building right over there, which is now a gutted, empty building. See those steps? 1917, I was sitting on that stoop with Al Borak. Remember Al Borak? He had the furniture store. I was sitting there with Al the day America went into the war. It was springtime, April or May, I forget. There's where your great aunt had the candy store. That's where my brother Morris had his first shoe store. Gee, is that still there? He says, on and on. We passed his school, 13th Avenue School, where he was the teacher's favorite. My teacher, she loved me. Herman, she said. On he goes all the way across the city. Opened up on either side, and there you can see him over there. I think that I have had uh, great care for my family and thought for my family as a son um, and as a relative to the rest of my family and as a brother to my brother and so on. And I think I've had considerable affection for the people who have been close to me as a husband, as a friend, uh, what have you. When I'm a writer, I'm someone else. Um, and um, I don't mean that I am consciously or deliberately or maliciously destructive. I mean that I'm free and, as it were, unburdened by allegiances that mean a great deal to me in my life. And so I'm without the restrictions of life, which I don't feel as restrictions in my life at whatsoever. But I would feel them as restrictions uh, in my work if I had to abide by s all, all sorts of considerations of discretion, of decorum, and so on. Um, now, I don't mean that I intend in my work to write exposés, uh, sensational documents whatsoever. I just feel that as a writer, I must be free to have a perspective larger deeper, darker than that of a son, a husband, a relative, or a friend. Um, the writer is, isn't those things. The writer is a writer. His wife, Margaret Anderson, who was later became Margaret Roth, marriage was not a very successful one. 
Unfortunately, was killed in an automobile accident in Central Park. I, w I was really only married for for a few years. I was married and living with uh, with my wife for I think it was two and a half years or a little less than two and a half years. Uh, and that was um, prior to between Goodbye Columbus and Letting Go. Uh, so I was out of that really. Uh, when I was writing Letting Go and When She Was Good, but the consequences of the marriage had been, for me, rather grave. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that gravity, I think, determined very much the tone of um, uh, Letting Go and the tone of When She Was mm -hmm. Good. I had seen um, life uh, in, in, in a darker way than I ever had before. Uh, my upbringing had not been dark. Uh, Whatever problems we had, whatever tensions and conflicts there were, they weren't dark. This was a darkness that I knew nothing about. My Life as a Man is the first of the books, really, in which he begins to engage uh, as a subject, and almost half-knowingly, I think, uh, because he had some difficulties getting into it. Uh, uh, begins to engage as a, engage as a subject. The tension between himself and his readers caused by uh, the explosion of speculation about what was invented and what was imagined, as against what was simply transcription of, of his actual life in, in Point Nice Complaint. I wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and wasn't getting it right. And the ways in which I was getting it wrong gave me the idea for how to put the book together. That I became interested in somebody writing versions of a thing to get it right. And so this story, which is, to put it uh, very simply and reduce it, is about a terrible, terrible, terrible marriage. That doesn't separate it from many, many other books, but it's one of that genre. Um, and a very lurid marriage, very bruising uh, for both the man and the woman. Um, and um, what I decided to do was to divide the book into um, two parts. One part I called Useful Fictions, the opening, and the second part is called uh, Calling Upon the um, Trademark of an Old uh, Terrible Magazine, My True Story. And, um, the opening, Useful Fictions, consisted of two short stories, or rather longish stories, uh, uh, written by the writer who will then narrate my true story. So these are his versions of his story. Uh, these are his useful fictions. To the reader who has not just gotten the drift, but begun to balk at the uniformly dismal situation that I have presented here, to the reader who finds himself unable to suspend his disbelief in a protagonist who voluntarily sustains an affair with a woman sexless to him and so disaster-ridden, I should say that in retrospect, I find him nearly impossible to believe in myself. Why should a young man, otherwise reasonable, far-sighted, watchful, judicious, and self-concerned, a man meticulously precise in the bread and butter concerns of life and the model of husbandry with his endowment, why should he pursue, in this obviously weighty encounter, a course so defiantly not in his interest? For the sake of defiance? Does that convince you? Then he delivers my true story and says, no, no, those were just stories I was telling. This is the real story. And he proceeds to uh, tell the story of his marriage as straightforwardly uh, as he possibly can. Uh, leaving in the rage, leaving in the self-pity, and so on. My writing by this time was wholly at the mercy of our marital confusion. How I struggled for a description, and alas, struggle still. But from one version to the next, nothing of consequence ever happened. Locales shifted, peripheral characters, parents, old flames, comforters, enemies, allies, came and went. And with about as much hope as a man attacking the polar ice cap with his own warm breath, I would attempt to release a flow of invention in me by changing the color of her eyes or my hair. 
Of course, to give up the obsession would surely have made the most sense. Only obsessed, I was as incapable of not writing about what was killing me as I was of altering or understanding it. In 1971, Roth made the first of many visits to Prague, and in the years that followed, he played a key role in supporting the work of Eastern European writers and getting it published for the first time in the West. Eventually, his fascination with this part of the world was to find its way into his fiction as one part of a major series of books charting the life of an imaginary American novelist called Nathan Zuckerman. Can I describe Zuckerman as a person? I can't. I don't, I, I guess I don't even choose to. Uh, the reason being that it took me four and a half books to present him in his fullness. Uh, the description has to come from someone else, really. From, uh, that's what a good critic can do. Um, on the other hand, having said that, I can give you the biographical data uh, about this guy, Zuckerman. Um, he happens to have been born the same year I was born and happens to, I think, have been born in the same place I was born. Um, uh, he's a writer. Um, in the first book, in The Ghost Writer, he's a young writer who gets in trouble with uh, the Jewish readers for a story he writes that's published um, somewhere. I think it's rather like my, it's rather like my experience in Defender with Defender of the Faith. So, needless to say, I drew upon um, bi my own biographical data, uh, and then off of that biographical data, invented a story which would encapsulate um, all my various experiences and um, um, collapse them into a strong, central, single, uh, potent narrative, if I was successful. And that's what I tried to do in The Ghost Rider. To me, when I first read you, it was as though the hallucinatory strains of Gogol had been somehow filtered through the humane skepticism of Chekhov. Relax, Nathan. It's not necessary. What did you do in the army? You were in Korea? He goes to visit an elderly writer. I, I, this elderly writer happens to, in the story to be younger than I am now, but at the time, even when I wrote I, this, I, I thought I, of him as an elderly writer, uh, alas and um, meets up with a young woman there who is a kind of young protege of the writers about whom he has many, many strong imaginings. Uh, in one of his imaginings, he sees her as uh, an Anne Frank who survived uh, the concentration camp and uh, came to live in America and uh, had her adventures here. Uh, where had you been before England? Uh, that's a long story. You'd been through the war? I missed the war. How so? Luck. I suppose that's how I missed it, too. What did you have instead? My childhood. What did you have instead? Somebody else's. I think perhaps you should go, Mr. Zuckerman. Shouldn't we say goodbye to the Lanoffs? I thought we had. He helped you to come to America. Yes. Pardon me for insisting, it's just... You bear some resemblance to Anne Frank. Not really. Zuckerman is a writer to whom fame comes, and celebrity, and I should say better notoriety, uh, a lot like the notoriety that came to me. Uh, and close as uh, the resemblances are, in some instances, between my experience and his, the resemblance really furnishes me with a jumping off place. Uh, the resemblance is, uh, to complicate and ruin the metaphor, a kind of diving board. Uh, and I get out on the end of the diving board and I jump up and down on the diving board, uh, jump up and down on the biographical data of my life, and then I leap forward into the imagining and into the Zuckerman books. So I leap into the water. What is the water? The water is the Zuckerman books. I leave behind the diving board. Enough of my writing, thought Zuckerman, enough of their scolding. Rebellion obedience, discipline explosion, 
Injunction, resistance. Accusation, denial. Defiance, shame. No, the whole goddamn thing has been a colossal mistake. This is not the position in life that I'd hoped to fill. I want to be an obstetrician. Who quarrels with an obstetrician? Even the obstetrician who delivered Bugsy Siegel goes to bed at night with a clear conscience. He catches what comes out, and everybody loves him. When the baby appears, they don't start shouting, you call that a baby? That's not a baby. No, whatever he hands them, they take it home. Every writer has his favorite material. Um, in the case of Roth, it's very important to remember that he's not using Zuckerman as, 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 a, as a creature of narcissism, or anything like that. On the contrary, Zuckerman has more troubles um, than the United States Treasury at this moment. Uh, he, he's he's crisis-laden. Everything that happened to him is a crisis, which is a very familiar Jewish feeling, you know. Roth is not the center of it. His mind's at the center of it. There's a great difference, you see. Oh, did you really? Being Zuckerman is one long performance, and the very opposite of what is thought of as being oneself. In fact, those who most seem to be themselves appear to me people impersonating what they think they might like to be, believe they ought to be, or wish to be taken to be by whoever is setting standards. So in earnest are they that they don't even recognize that being in earnest is the act. For certain self-aware people, however, this is not possible. To imagine themselves being themselves, living their own real, authentic, or genuine life, has for them all the aspects of a hallucination. He was very highly strung <laughs> fellow, <laughs> and he still is. But I think, uh, and he was the reason we, I and mean, it was extraordinary that we met when we did. We were both going through very difficult periods in our lives, and we were both totally alone, which doesn't often happen at the age that we both were. And I think for both of us, and certainly for him, I know, having a proper home that's you know, that, that's there, and someone who is there, and, and a partnership and a relationship, uh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt anybody. I came to England because um, England is Claire's home. And uh, when we began to live together, we decided we would live half of each year in my country and half in hers. It was as simple as that, really. The saga of Nathan Zuckerman ends in London, where, in the last chapter of The Counterlife, the American writer is made to feel increasingly unwelcome. This time, it was some of Roth's English readers who took exception. If there is no anti-Semitism in Great Britain, and if there is no group of people in Great Britain who hold anti-Semitic beliefs in disproportion to the general population, then I was mistaken in the counter-life to propose that there might be a young woman uh, Maria Freshfield, from uh, a privileged, from the privileged provincial gentry, who discovers that her family is less than thrilled when she arrives back from America to say she's going to marry a New York Jew. If, on the other hand, there is anti-Semitism in Great Britain, as perhaps there might be, and if there is a group of people in Great Britain who do hold anti-Semitic beliefs in disproportion to the general population, as perhaps there might be. Then I wasn't mistaken to propose that Maria Freshfield and her New York Jew, Nathan Zuckerman, might have certain difficulties when they married. And those scenes in which I depicted their difficulties might not be the outpourings of a paranoid Jewish imagination, as some of my English critics maintain but in fact, well within the range of English possibilities. England's made a Jew of me in only eight weeks, which on reflection might be the least painful method. A Jew without Jews, without Judaism, without Zionism, without Jewishness, without a temple or an army or even a pistol. A Jew clearly without a home. 
just the object itself, like a glass or an apple. At first, I think he felt very released, as one does in a new place, very free of the old burdens, um, made a lot of new friends, which he's kept, um, and was very happy. Uh, then I think he became, he would perhaps tell you something else, but I think he became very much afraid of being cut off from his subject, which is American life, um, to the extent that he perhaps feared that he couldn't, wouldn't have enough material to feed him. And um, we came back. Good morning, Edward. Oh, God. How, How are you today? Good. How about my, my newspaper? Since Zuckerman, I seem to have shed uh, disguises and spoken in my own name. I met Lost. Look at the men they lost. By and large, I have abandoned Portnoy's Kepish's, the fellow in the breast, uh, Zuckerman's, and presented a character uh, called Philip Roth. Neither one of them very good. Anything else, Philip? No, that's it, Edward. That's all today? That's all today. Thank you, sir. Let's lose prospects, keep Eddie. I tried in the facts to be as candid as I could be about how I became a writer, all the influences that had converged to make me not only a writer, but the, right, the kind of writer I became. Um, and that was uh, an, uh, an unusual kind of writing for me. I'd never done that before. Um, I had to rely on memory. I had to rely on, the, on, on other people who I asked about the period. I couldn't use any scenes or dialogue. I decided against that. I think if one looks at that book, uh, you'll see there are, there are no scenes, there are no dialogues. Those are things I rely on pretty heavily in, in, in a novel. Now, at the end of that book, um, <clears throat> uh, Zuckerman uh, appears because I uh, uh, say that I send this manuscript to him in a preface. Uh, I send the manuscript to Zuckerman and I ask him what he thinks of this, this book. It's uh, my shot, not at his biography, but at my own. And in the long uh, coda to the book, some 50 pages or so, Zuckerman writes me back and says, don't publish this book. It, you don't know how to write this kind of stuff. And besides, I don't believe it, says he. Dear Roth, I've read the manuscript twice. Here is the candor you ask for. Don't publish. You are far better off writing about me than accurately reporting your own life. Could it be that you've turned yourself into a subject, not only because you're tired of me, but because you believe I am no longer someone through whom you can detach yourself from your biography at the same time that you exploit its crises, themes, tensions, and surprises. Well, on the basis of what I've just read, I'd say you're still as much in need of me as I of you, and that I need you is indisputable. As for characterization, you, Roth, are the least completely rendered of all your protagonists. Your gift isn't to personalize your experience, but to personify it, to embody it in the representation of a person who is not yourself. You are not an autobiographer. You're a personificator. You have the reverse experience of most of your American contemporaries. Your acquaintance with the facts, your sense of the facts, is much less developed than your understanding, your intuitive weighing and balancing of fiction. You make a fictional world that is far more exciting than the world it comes out of. My guess is that you've written metamorphoses of yourself so many times, you no longer have any idea what you are or ever were. By now, what you are is a walking text. What I was really demonstrating in that coda, in which Zuckerman appears to challenge my book, my story, was my doubt. Because that's part of, that's a strong ingredient in my autobiography. I wanted to dramatize my doubt. Uh, my doubt not only about my ability to tell my own story, but my doubt um, about anybody's ability to tell his or her own story. Um, and so, my story as told by me, and Zuckerman's challenge to my story, that's my story. 
In Roth's 20th book, Operation Shylock, true and false biographies become a matter of life and death. The central character is Roth himself, and the book includes a description of his visit to the trial in Jerusalem of John Demjanjuk, later convicted of being the Nazi war criminal Ivan the Terrible. There he was, there it was, bald now and grown stocky, a big cheerful palooka of 68, a good father, a good neighbor, loved by his family and all his friends. It was nearly 50 years since he'd last smashed open anyone's skull, and he was by now as benign and unfrightening as an old boxing champ, good old Johnny. Man the demon as good old Johnny. It was a startling moment for me. Um, because, to begin with, is he or is he, isn't he? Was he or wasn't he? There's that question, which is very large. And then if he was Ivan the Terrible, then one was in the presence of um, a human monster. Uh, if he wasn't Ivan the Terrible, then one was in the presence of some tremendous misunderstanding and um, human injustice. Loved his garden, everyone said. Rather tend tomatoes now and raise string beans than bore a hole in somebody's ass with a drill. No, you've got to be young and in your prime. You've got to be on top of things and raring to go to manage successfully even something as simple as having a little fun like that with somebody's big fat behind. He'd sowed his oats and settled down, all that rough stuff sworn off long ago. Could only barely remember now all the hell he'd raised. So many years, the way they fly. No, he was somebody else entirely. That Hellraiser was no longer him. So there he was, or there he wasn't. As the book progresses, Roth's adventures in Israel become ever more bizarre, embroiling him in a secret mission for Israeli intelligence, the Mossad, and an extraordinary personal encounter, perhaps the strangest ever described in Roth's writing. It turns out that at that time, roaming through the world, uh, there was a man uh, who, for all I know, is still living, though I haven't heard from him in recent years, pret who pretended to be me, uh, a man bearing a very strong resemblance to me, a rather uncanny resemblance to me. He arrived in Israel, uh, reg uh, re registered at the King David Hotel, uh, which is a very nice big hotel in, in Jerusalem, and uh, announced that Philip Roth had arrived in Israel, the writer, um, and that he was a spokesman for a doctrine he called diasporism. Um, he said, presented himself as a kind of anti-Moses who was going to lead the Jews out of Israel back uh, to Europe. Um, and because he felt that Zionism had exhausted itself as an ideology and as a program for the Jews, and in fact, he said, in interviews and uh, to all kinds of journalists, uh, Israeli and foreign, that uh, he was there to prevent a second Holocaust, which he felt that Zionism was not unlikely to produce. Well, these are not ideas I hold, and I didn't much like these ideas being expounded as mine. When he sent me the manuscript of Operation Shylock, I was in no way prepared for it, though I had read uh, everything I believed previously that he had uh, published, I found myself uh, quite astonished. By the time I had reached the end of the first hundred pages, I did not know where I was. I was so surprised, and uh, these surprises kept coming. Well, it's a very bold book. Uh, it's going to delight uh, some people and uh, affront many deeply, because they won't really know what to make of it. And there is a sort of, uh, the, f the focus of the irony is sliding. You don't, uh, you, you don't know when he, means to, uh, when he means you to take him seriously. Uh, and when you think you've got him uh, fixed to a position, connected to a position, you find that he's gotten away from you. It wasn't just meeting somebody who looks like you. Uh, it was somebody who was exploiting my name uh, for his own purposes, purposes which I still cannot fathom. Um, and the book is an attempt to fathom those purposes of his. At one point in the book, I described this man as a wildly delineated nothing. Um, 
vividness he did not lack. Um, how much was craziness and how much was cunning? Uh, how much was strategic and how much was uh, improvisation? How much was perversity? And how much was uh, willful, deliberate, and meaningful? I haven't the faintest idea. He has now gone, I think, probably further than I would have thought any writer ever could do in mixing up art and reality. It is very difficult indeed by the time you have finished Operation Shylock and you come to the disclaimer at the end of it saying that all this is fiction. You quite agree that all of this is fiction, but it's very hard to know exactly how you are to deal with it then on the local level when you go back into it, where it depends upon the shock of an extraordinary verisimilitude and an insistence that this indeed did happen. Note to the reader, this book is a work of fiction. Um, the names, characters, places, and incidents either are products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events or locales of persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. This confession is false. Um, I was um, asked uh, by my uh, um, Mossad um, supervisor uh, to uh, say this at the end of this book. In fact, in the last section of the book, I recount the scene and the conversation in which he makes this request of me uh, because he didn't want me to um, uh, reveal uh, anything about uh, this assignment I was on. Uh, and he felt uh, I should say the book was fiction, so it seemed to me uh, he had sufficient clout with me, and uh, I decided to accede to his wish. And so I have this note here. Um, and I did my duty. Um, beyond that, there isn't much to say. Say that you will understand.